What a God he is. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Master. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of our God. I love you, Master. We want to quickly go to the word of the, to the Lord in prayer tonight and ask God to meet some needs. And Kelly will put those up on the board. But let's continue to pray for Brother Moore. Amen. Also, Sister Stewart had surgery this morning and everything went well. So we want the Lord to continue to strengthen her and help her and touch her. Any unspoken requests by an uplifted hand? And God knows. Aren't you glad you can give up? Just raise your hand and say, hey, God knows the need. Why don't you lift the other hand in faith right now and then lift your voices and let's touch heaven. God, tonight we believe you. We trust you. We know, God, that you're moving in great ways. We know that you're a miracle worker. We know that you're a way maker, oh God. And tonight, every request, God, would you touch Brother Moore tonight and strengthen his body. Touch Sister Stewart and bring healing to her. Give her a quick recovery, I pray. God, of heaven, every unspoken request in this building tonight. You can reach into the resources that you have, God, and instantly meet every need that's in this place. We thank you for what you're doing, God. Let it be done according to your will and your purpose, I pray. In Jesus' name, let it be done, I pray, oh God, in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated, asking our ushers to get ready to receive our Wednesday evening tithe and offering. Move a little quickly tonight because I want to teach a little while before we take communion. Let me mention a couple of things. Getting a little bit closer, the concrete got poured out back today. So thank the Lord for that. And thankfully he's doing that. We tried Monday and Tuesday, it was just too cold. It was bitter, brutal cold, especially Monday with that north wind blowing. We stayed about 20 minutes and said, forget it, there'll be another day. So we waited, but we got that done today. Maybe they'll be doing just a little bit more tomorrow. And doesn't the sign on the front of the building look awesome? It looks good. Just gives a whole new look. Brightens things up a little. Just in case you didn't know where you were. Let you know when you pull into the parking lot. Let Mitchell, would you pray the Lord's blessings over this tonight? God bless you as you give today.
faithful God. Faithful God. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight is our communion service, and I know a lot of times it's easy just to rush in and say a few words and take communion, but I felt it was important this time to take a little time and talk about the unity of communion. The unity of communion. When Jesus instituted communion in the upper room that night and he also washed the disciples' feet, the foot washing was a sign of servanthood. Communion was a sign of unity. So he was giving them the two keys or the two foundations to being part of the New Testament church is you have to be a servant and you have to be united together. Amen. And I'm thankful he did that. I want to read tonight from 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse number 17. I apologize if I go a little quickly. I've got a lot of ground I want to cover. I'll try not to go so fast you can't write. But if you would, just try to keep up if you can. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. It's interesting. He starts out this whole passage about communion saying, hey, look, you're not coming together for the right reasons. There's a problem here. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone's taking before other his own supper. He's saying, you're coming together saying it's for the Lord's Supper, but you're, you're kind of doing this wrong. The ones coming early go ahead and eat to their fill and leave nothing for the ones after. It's kind of become self-motivated. Said, everyone taketh before his own, before others his own supper, and one is hungry and another's drunk. And what? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament uh, in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this, many, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye not, come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. God bless you. You can be seated. 1 Corinthians 11 is probably the most well-known and well-studied passage of Scripture that addresses the subject of communion. There's a lot that's going on there. And I like that particular passage to study because Paul it really comes to the heart of the matter of what communion is all about and the purpose behind it. He addresses a lot of things there. And the, the first time that we see what we would call communion observed was in the upper room where Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Feast of the Passover in Luke 22. Now going back to the Old Testament Passover, it was the holiest of all the Jewish feasts. They had a lot of feasts and celebrations, but Passover was the holiest feast of all and it commemorated the day that God freed the Israelites from their 400-year bondage in Egypt. So you can understand why it would be a great celebration, why it would be a time of remembering what God had done for them when after 400 years of captivity in that one night, God set them free. On that night, God's death angel passed over any home whose doorway has been sprinkled with the blood of the lamb. We pick up a type and a shadow from this that deliverance comes only from the blood. And through the blood, they sprinkled that blood on the doorpost. Then when they left Egypt, when the Lord told them to leave, they walked out under the blood. They had to cross underneath the blood that was there as their covering. 
Jesus used that setting to teach about his own sacrifice. So the Passover celebrated deliverance that was physical. It celebrated del deliverance that was physical. Communion celebrates that which is spiritual. So Passover was all about a physical deliverance, about being set free from a physical bondage. Communion is our release or our deliverance from spiritual bondage. The Passover celebrated deliverance that was temporary because they went into bondage again. They had other issues again. So Passover was all about that which was temporary. Communion celebrates deliverance that is permanent. We are permanently freed from sin by the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The Passover celebrated physical deliverance under the Old Covenant. It's what they were freed from in the Old Covenant. <clears throat> Communion celebrates spiritual deliverance under the New Covenant. It's just a very basic foundation. It comes out of the Old Testament celebration of the Passover, but the Passover was temporal. It was temporary. It only dealt with the flesh. But for us, communion deals with the spiritual man and frees us from the bondage of sin. Scripture makes it very clear that the early church regularly partook of communion, much more often than we do. Acts 2 and 42 says they were continually devoting themselves to the teaching, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. That doesn't necessarily mean they were always eating a meal together, but they were partaking of the Lord's Supper together on a regular basis. They would come together for preaching, teaching, and to celebrate communion. So I need to say here that, that the way the early church celebrated communion was somewhat different than what we do. They would not only take of, of the, the cup and the bread, but they would eat a meal together. It would be a time of fellowship, but the purpose, the, the goal, the focus was on the Lord's Supper, not on their individual physical dinner. It's centered around that. Communion, the whole purpose of communion is it serves to unite us together in Christ. That's what communion's all about, uniting us into the body of Christ. It is all about unity. I've often said that the best time for a church to take communion is when there's a lack of unity because that's what it's all about, is bringing us back together again. Now in this, when Paul addresses the Corinthian church in 1 first, in Corinthians 11, what you find are that the reason he addresses it the way he does, and he comes about it the way he does, there were three areas of insensitivity they were dealing with. It's kind of missed if you don't study it for this, you don't see what's going on, and you just jump to what communion is. He said, but there's three areas here that you need to look at that, that, that the, the Corinthian church had became insensitive in, and if we're not careful, the same thing can happen to us. So he's saying that you can get desensitized or become insensitive in these three areas, not even realizing what you're doing sometimes, not meaning anything by it, but when you become insensitive in these areas, it can break the unity of a church. So he's instructing them that here's what they need to do. And if we avoid these things, so I want to teach them is if we avoid them, then we build stronger unity in the church. You know the old saying, a ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? So I thought tonight was a good time to teach what Paul was teaching to the church at Corinth and saying, look, here's where you've been missing it on the unity thing. And these are the areas that are kind of a challenge to you. So take a look at these and be sure you get them right. First of all, don't be insensitive to your church family because we are the body of Christ after all. So you've got to be careful not to be insensitive to each other and each other's needs. The, the purpose of this passage is not just to give us information and instruction about communion so that we can use it when we take communion. That's in there and it's good, but that's not the sole purpose. The passage also, Paul intended it to expose and condemn insensitivity. To say, here are the things that may be causing you struggles and it's bringing a little bit of fracture in the church. Communion is an ordinance that the family takes part in and it was given to the local church. He's addressing it in that local church. Now, it's for the body at large, but it's meant for us to take together. You know, you, you can't just say, well, y'all do what you're going to do. We're, we'll observe communion at home after dinner. We'll, we'll take communion at our house. It wasn't given to you as a family, a, 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 a nuclear family of mom, dad, kids. It was given to the body of Christ of brothers and sisters. So you partake of it together together in this setting, when we're together, and we can unify together in this. It'd be wrong to have that mentality of, well, I don't want to take communion with the church. I'll just take it at home. I'll just do my own thing at home. 
That'd be wrong because this is an ordinance given to the local church, to the family of God that's gathered together to worship and fellowship. Paul wrote this epistle to the church, not to individual families. So what was communion supposed to be like? What do we draw out of this? And I'm not going to go back and read all of these scriptures, but I want to give you the things that he does address here that communion was supposed to be like. First of all, it was supposed to be about communing with Christ. It was communing with Christ according to 1 Corinthians 10 and 16. Communion is about communing with Christ, being in unity and fellowship with him. He goes right on in the next verse and says it's about communing with your church family. It's communing with your church family. You can't be united with your family if you're not united with God. And you really can't be united with God if you're not united with your family. You get that? You, you can't be at odds with the body and be right with God. Impossibility. No matter how you justify it, no matter how you structure it, no matter how you reason it, when you're not at unity with your brothers and sisters, you are not at unity with God. No matter how much you worship, you give, you show up, you pray, you commit, you do. You have to be in unity with the body to be in unity with God. It was for the purpose of worshiping together in holiness. When you read 1 Corinthians 10, 20 through 22, so that the body comes together to worship God collectively in holiness. It was for worshiping together in holiness. It was for remembering the cross. We need to remember the cross, 1 Corinthians 11 and 25. It is remembering the price that he paid at Calvary. Then it is proclaiming salvation in Christ alone. Proclaiming salvation in Christ alone, 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. It would have been important to him for them to celebrate the Lord's Supper and not just Passover because if they held on to Passover they would be showing that they're holding to the traditions of men instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's remembering the cross, proclaiming salvation, and lastly, anticipating the Lord's return. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. Communion is not just about remembering that he died for us. It's reminding us also he's coming back for us, that he is returning the same way that he left. So that's what it should have been all about. That's what he's leading up to in the chapter previous and the writings previous to this. But what had com communion become for them? What had happened that had changed it that Paul felt that he needed to address it? He starts out by saying, it's not for the better, but for the worse. Instead of communion improving where you are, you've let it draw you apart and it's made things worse because you've kind of moved away from what the purpose of communion was to begin with. In other words, their behavior was so sinful they actually went backwards spiritually every time they gathered. Instead of coming together and uniting, you ever been in those kind of churches? I hope not. It's like they get more carnal every time they come together. They leave matter every time they leave the house of God. They leave more fractured every time they leave. He said, this is where you're headed. He said, there are divisions among you. There are divisions among you in 1 Corinthians 11 and 18. So what it is, and here's one, this may just step on some of our toes all across the building from north to south, east to west. What he was saying was there are cliques and obvious divisions when you're coming together and should be coming together for communion. We've got this little group over here that fellowships together. We've got this little group over here that spends time together. We've got this little group over here that's got their own thing going on. And Paul said, you can't do that. The body doesn't work that way. You know, it's like have a party but only invite four people out of the whole church. That can be awkward, especially if you're not the one that, if you're the one that wasn't invited. It's a little awkward. So, you know, so be careful of that. You know, well, I only pray with certain people. I only share the word with certain people. I only encourage certain people. He said, no, no, that's not the way it works. So that's not what you can There are divisions here, and we can't have that. There, he said, no, there have to be divisions. He goes right on to say there has to be divisions. He said, but for the right reason. The reason divisions ought to come is to point out who the heretics are, to point out who's in false doctrine. There shouldn't be any division at all among those that believe the same thing that are part of the body of Christ. He said, if you do this, if you, if you are the one that causes these divisions, if you're the one that's bringing that separation, you're going to face serious judgment. So then what's the point of all this? What's the point is? The point is that before we think about specific instructions for communion, we really need to stop and consider the sin of insensitivity that the Corinthian church had towards one another. 
They were becoming insensitive to one another. Everybody was doing their own thing. When you study the history of it, literally, there were wealthy people showing up with more food for the dinner, but they would come early and not tell that other people come that early. And they would eat all the good food and leave scraps for the ones who didn't have to bring, who only had less. He said, there's a problem here. You're missing the point. It's not bad to eat together. It'd be like us having dinner like we do sometimes. And some of y'all separating your dishes aside and say, well, only my family can eat this. No anybody else to touch this. He said, you can't do that. You're breaking the unity of the body. The reality is that we have the same tendency sometimes if we're not careful and don't really come back to communion on a regular basis and understand what it's all about. You ever pause long enough to consider that by your lack of attendance to church, I might as well go ahead and address this because it's about unity. When you miss church for so many odd and strange and weird reasons, you're breaking the unity of the body. You're taking it. It'd be like you getting up and going to work and, and your right hand saying, I'm not going with you today. It's just going to stay home. Or your left foot saying, you know, I'll catch up to you later. I got somewhere else to go besides going with you today. So you ever think about that? That when you, when you are not in attendance, you are displaying an insensitivity to the body. You're saying, I don't care what I'm bringing away from the body or what may be missing because I'm not there. The Lord cares about it. Each time you decide not to fellowship with God's people, you take your gifts with you and the body suffers because your contribution to the body is not being fulfilled. Everybody adds something to the body. I don't have time to go into the epistles that talk about that, that the body fitly framed together. The eye is the eye, the ear is the ear, the nose is the nose, the legs. The body is the body, but it all fitly frames together. And if you miss any part of it, those of you that, that have had COVID and lost your sense of taste and smell, realize just how important those parts of the body were. Imagine if that was totally gone and it never came back. It'd be like there's something missing in my life. So when people aren't in church where they need to be, you're taking away from the body. You're taking away from what God intends. You didn't take the time to consider how what God designed you to bring to the church is now missing, and your lack of service is also being insensitive. You're saying, well, you know, whatever I have to contribute doesn't need to be there. It's not important. I've got this, this other thing, this birthday party. Got to rearrange my sock drawer. Don't like who's preaching today. Don't like who's teaching Sunday school, so I'm sure not going early. And you take away from the body that's supposed to be here collectively together to bring what the body brings to the church. How much greater is it? Anybody ever been in a worship service with about three other people? It's not quite the same as having 150 worshiping together, is it? The Lord's there in the midst of it, but there's something about adding more collectively to the body and everybody being here and everybody worshiping and everybody putting their voice and their energy into it and putting their heart and soul and spirit into it. It makes a huge difference. Now, so I don't want to be misunderstood. I understand there are times we all have to miss being in church. I'm not talking about that. There's times you are sick. There's times you have to work. There's times that things genuinely come up and you can't be here. Totally understandable. Not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the times that you can, but you choose not to be. Or something else seems to be more important or more critical. So much the more as you see the day approaching, he said, you need to assemble together. That's about unity with the body. You're here with the body. What we often fail to discern is how the body of Christ is, is being equipped by God with every believer doing their part. And when you're not here, you're not doing your part. Everybody has a part. So if you get to where it just you don't think it really matters, that's where you need to ask yourself, am I becoming insensitive to what's important to the body of Christ and to the local church? It's just as bad when you take your gift or ability and use it more for yourself than you do for the church you're a part of. This is your church family. This is your church body. Our, our energies ought to be spent here, you know, trying to do things to help the body and to win the loss to the body to bring them here and just, it'd be kind of like, you know, if I only wanted to preach or teach other places, I want pastor I just never want to preach or teach here. So somebody else can do all the preaching and teaching and you say, well, that's not going to work. That's not fair to the body because you're taking your gift and your anointing and your ability and you're going somewhere else and using it, but not investing it here. 
And he's saying that becomes insensitive. You become selfish and, well, let me do it on my own little ministry, my own little place, my own little way, my own little area, whether it affects the church at all or not. But we should be investing into the body that we're a part of. That's what he wants us to do. So we need to filter 1 Corinthians 11 into our decisions of how we interact with each other. Are we being unselfish? Are we really giving of ourselves to each other? Do we really go out of our way to help one another? So don't be insensitive to your church family. Next, don't be insensitive to the death of Christ. Don't be insensitive to the death of Jesus Christ. I think that, that communion is going to be interesting as time goes on. I'd like for us to take it more during the year than we have in previous years. I think it's going to become more vitally important that we stay connected to what communion is all about. Because as religion is slipping off the cliff real fast in our nation, as Christianity is being thrown down the hill and over the boat and all that, we need to hold to the things that are critical to us, identifying us as the body of Christ. And we need that in a very, very real way. There, there's coming a day if, 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 the, if the political world has its way, Christianity will become extinct in America. They will do their best to annihilate it. So there will be things, there will be attacks, there will be things that happen, things that come against us that we better be more unified than we have ever been before. We better be more committed to the church, more committed to God, more committed to one another. And it can be very easy to become desensitized or insensitive to the death of Jesus Christ. Paul gives us the desired order of communion. He lays it out. First of all, you begin communion by giving thanks. You give thanks. It's about being thankful. The Passover was about being thankful for deliverance. Communion is about being thankful for that spiritual deliverance that he brought to us. Anybody ever heard the term Eucharist? Some people refer to communion as the Eucharist because that, this word here, give thanks, comes from the Greek word Eucharista. And that's where they get the ordinance of the Eucharist. It really means thanks, to give thanks. So when we consider this, this bread that we take that we're thankful, he took the bread and he gave thanks. He's giving thanks for Christ's body that was broken or offered for us. The thanks is not distance or divorce from the body, from the broken body of Christ. It's not just giving thanks for the blessings, it's giving thanks for his brokenness. You have to remember this is for you, this is for me. Communion is for us it benefits us. Can I tell you that communion, us partaking of communion, doesn't do anything for Jesus Christ. Doesn't do anything for God. It's what it does for us. It's for us, for you, it's for you as a sacrifice because it paid your penalty for sin. It paid a penalty you could not pay. It took care of a debt that every one of us owed, that there is no way we could have ever paid that. It's for you as a substitute because he died in your place. The only way we could have paid the price was to die. It's the only thing we could have done was given up our own life because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That sacrifice that Adam and Eve, you know, the, the covering of the, the leaves in the garden was not sufficient. It took the shedding of blood to bring them a covering. So for you and I, we needed that substitute. It's also for you as a satisfaction because his death satisfied God's righteous character because we couldn't. There's no offering we could give, no sacrifice we could make, no prayer we could pray that would ever satisfy the righteousness of God's character. It took the death of Jesus Christ to satisfy God's righteous character. It's for you as a propitiation or a payment because his death turned away God's wrath from you because of your sin. His death stood right between you and the judgment for sin. His death, he became death so you could live. He died so that you and I could live in spiritual freedom in eternity with him. So he became that propitiation. He became that penalty that was paid, that price that was paid. It's for you and for your benefit because his righteousness is now your righteousness. The only righteousness you and I have is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We have no righteousness on our own. We have no holiness on our own. We have nothing good in us on our own. When you take the cup, when he talks about the cup, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is signified by the cup as it represents the new covenant that Jesus ratifies with his blood. The old covenant was under blood also, but it was blood that could not redeem. 
It was blood that could not justify. All it could do was roll the sin ahead. That, that blood of the Passover allowed them to pass underneath the blood. And then when the, the sacrifice of atonement was instituted, all it did was roll their sins ahead one year at a time. It kept pushing them ahead to Calvary. But it's this here new covenant. When he said, take drink of this cup for it is my blood in the new Testament or in the new covenant. He said, I ratify this covenant with my own blood. And in his blood is the life. That's where the life is. That's where new life is. So when Moses confirmed that first covenant, Mount Sinai, he sprinkled animal blood for the first covenant. But it would take the blood of Christ for the second covenant, Exodus 24 and 8. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So it was a covenant. It was an agreement from God to man. It was not even a mutual covenant. Because man couldn't agree. Man had nothing to offer God. It was a covenant from God to usward. And he gave it to us freely. Hebrews 11, or 8, 13 tells us he ratified this new covenant with Christ's blood that was shed once and for all. Probably one of the most beautiful Old Testament passages dealing with this is Jeremiah 31 and 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like their covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. I love that last part of their sin I will remember no more. You realize that under the new covenant, under the blood of Jesus Christ, is the only place that he forgets our sin and forgives it and he remembers it no more? Because under the Old Testament covenant of atonement, he remembered year by year rolling the sin ahead. He knew that every year, this is this year's and last year's and the years before. He never took it totally away. But only under the blood of Jesus Christ were those sins obliterated forever. And he said, I will remember them no more forever. They will be gone. Thank God. What a reason to be thankful that Jesus Christ laid down his life and shed his blood. We're not coming back every year with a new sacrifice. But he paid the price once and for all. He was the mediator of this covenant. He fulfilled it by giving up his body and blood. Hebrews 10 and 10. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So the writer then goes on to give two purposes of this ordinance. One in verse 23 and one in verse 26. He said, here are the two purposes of communion. It serves a lot of things and does a lot for you and you need to know all this. But here are the two purposes. First of all, in remembrance of me, he said, this do in remembrance of me. This do in remembrance of me. Remember the price I paid. Remember that I came and walked among men and laid down my life so that men could go free. Secondly, he said, to show the Lord's death Till he comes. He said, I don't want you to get hung up on just what I did. I want you to remember that although your sins are forgiven now, there's coming a day I'm coming back to redeem your body. Your spiritual man's made right, but there's going to come a day that the trump of God is going to sound, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. In that moment, corruptible will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. He's saying, so don't look at, and here's why we celebrate communion. It's not just the looking back at what he did, just in remembrance of him. He said, but remembering it with a forward look that you've got great reason to rejoice that one day I'm coming to take my body out of this world. By his death, we're all made partners of this new covenant that God established. The Corinthians had become insensitive to his death because they weren't seeing the change in their life they ought to see. You read the book, the, the epistles of the Corinthians, and Paul is addressing things that they had already given up that were creeping back into the church. He constantly is going back saying, this shouldn't be named here, this shouldn't be named there. Why are you letting this back in? Why are you doing this? And he's saying, if you would remember the Lord's body, if you would not be insensitive to his death, you know what, if we really have a good view of Calvary on a regular basis, 
I've often said if we would visit Calvary and hell on a regular basis, we'd have no problem being in love with Jesus Christ every day of our life. But a regular visit to Calvary, a regular visit back to the price that he paid in a world that is desensitized, us by Hollywood and advertising and bombarded our senses with everything imaginable, it's hard to move people with the crucifixion anymore. It's hard to move them with just how gruesome and gory and bloody his death was and how painful it was. So, but if you can remember that death and then once you let it settle in your heart, then you can grab onto the fact that you have a reason to rejoice. Communion ought to remind us of the great cost of our salvation and provide for us the unity that we must have as being equal partakers in the new covenant. <clears throat> Brother Davis, you may have more than I have in this life, but we've got the same blood in the covenant. Brother Yarbrough, you may own more property than I own, but under the covenant we're equal. Where it really matters, all under the blood. So we are united. We are unified by the blood and body of Jesus Christ. He's saying if we can keep that in the church and not let other things separate us, who's got an education, who doesn't? Who has a better vehicle than somebody else? Who has a better house or better job or better this? Or better? He said none of that matters. When you come in here, we are all united together because we had one common Savior, and it was his blood that covers all of us and that unifies us together. Don't be insensitive to your responsibility of self-examination. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Because we don't want anybody to correct us. If we don't correct ourselves, we sure don't want anybody else correcting us. You know, if we won't tell ourselves we have a problem, we don't want to tell us we have a problem. You have a problem. If you don't realize you have a problem, it's not going to do any good for them to tell you you have a problem. You know, if one person says you have a problem, it may not be you. It could be them. If two or three people tell you that you have a problem, it, it, it may not even still be you. It could be them. But, honey, when everybody starts telling you you have a problem, guess what? You're the proud owner of a problem. You just haven't accepted it yet. And here's what he's saying is you need this self-examination in your life. And he puts a heaviness here. We, every one of us, the Bible talks about us being our own priest before God. Nobody offers sacrifice for you. Nobody gets saved for you. Nobody can be saved for you. You have to be saved for yourself. God doesn't even make the promise, and this is going to mess with some people's philosophy and theology, but it is unscriptural to say that God said, as long as I'm faithful, he'll make sure that my son or my daughter is saved. No, he won't. Being saved, saved means you're saved. It does not guarantee that they're saved. They have to decide on their their own, they want to be saved. They have to make right decisions. So God's not going to predicate somebody else's salvation on my salvation. He's not going to put that on me. He's not going to put that on you. That you do your best, you live right, you preach right, you teach right, you walk right, you do right. You be the example to your family. And hopefully by the grace and mercy of God, they'll be saved. But that person has to do self-examination also. So this self-examination is not always easy. But it's necessary. Again, the book of James talks about that man that looks in a mirror and immediately forgets what manner of man he just saw. He sees the problem, the fault, the flaw, but then he walks away and forgets what he just looked at. The Lord puts the Holy Ghost in every one of us. Anybody in here ever felt conviction? That's your mirror. That's part of your self-examination when God convicts you over something. is him trying to get you to take a good look at yourself and saying there are things that don't need to be here. If you partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily, you are guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So what he told him said, if you take this unworthily, if you take communion and you're not where you need to be, you're not living how you ought to be, you're not examining yourself, you've got things in your life, you've got ought against a brother or sister, you've got hidden sin in your life, you've got things that you're not controlling, he said, you, you are eating it unworthily and you're guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. A, a literal translation of this means those who take communion flippantly saying it's no big deal, I'll just take it. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life, I should still take communion. Like some denominations that take it every Sunday like clockwork and then live all week long, but they come back to church just in time to repent and then take communion. 
He said, that's just like you're murdering Jesus Christ all over again. That's really how Paul puts it. He said, you're actually crucifying Christ afresh when you take this unworthily and you take it flippantly when you're not where you need to be in your walk with God. Now, don't talk about perfection here. None of us are perfect. I mean, if I'm not careful here, nobody will want to take communion tonight. We'll pass it out. Two people will take it. That'll be it. I'm not talking about that. But you know when there's issues in your life you need to work on and get cleared up and taken care of? But to just override them and think they're not a big deal is wrong. We should never regard communion, the celebration of communion, as just some ritual. You know, actually communion, when you look at this, communion is not just, I hope you're catching this out, is communion is not just what we will do tonight by taking the bread and the cup. Communion is what we do every time we come to church. Communion is what we do every time we worship together. We are communing with the body of Christ. We are unifying with the body. So I would want you to feel just as strongly that I need to be in the house of God. To be right with God, I need to be here worshiping and praying and and receiving the word and, and responding to the word. We should feel just that strongly. 1 Corinthians 11 and 29, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we've got to take special care. Every believer has to take special care in discerning truth and make sure that we're living right and we're, we're discerning the Lord's body the way that it ought to be. He said, many are weak and sickly and some have died as a result. According to 1 Corinthians 11, 30, he said, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. He put it right out there. He said, some, of, some are so extreme in being flippant towards communion, God killed them. Again, I'm not trying to scare you out of taking communion. But I want you to understand, to the Lord, it is serious business, this thing that he calls unity. Why? Because he that sows discord among the brethren, that's an abomination to God. He's all about us being unified. He's about us being together. So we want to make sure we're united in this. So what is the remedy to this? Self-examination. You have to examine yourself. You're, You're commanded to examine yourself regularly. It's up to you to look in your spiritual mirror and say, am I aligning with where I need, am I praying like I need to be praying? Thank you again to all those of you that have signed up for prayer. If you haven't, please do so and come by the house of the Lord. You know, don't just sign up for one or two days the whole month. It'd be great if you take one day every week and come by for an hour. But this is part of our unity. We want to unify in prayer here. But you unite together. But you've got to examine yourself. Am I praying? Am I fasting regularly? Am I in the word of God on a regular basis? Am I doing good deeds? Am I doing Christian acts for other people? Am I doing what I ought to be doing? You have to examine your heart for sensitivity to your church family. Are you being sensitive to each other's needs? You know, the majority of needs that would ever come up in this church can be met right here by the other people in the church. They can be met. We just have to be sensitive to know where is that need and what can we do. You have to examine your heart for any area of sinfulness that you've not made right with the Lord or a brother and sister in Christ. That's up to you. to you know, We can cover those up real easy. You know, we justify sometimes because we've got ought against our brother. Well, they, they said it first. They did this. They did that. Jesus doesn't leave any room for that. It doesn't work that way. He said, if you bring your gift to the altar and you've got ought against your brother, you leave your gift there and you go make it right and then you come back and pick up your gift because you can't be unified if there's tension in the relationship. First Corinthians 11 and 28, but a man must examine himself and in so doing he is to eat of the cup, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So you self-examine and say, okay, this is where I need to be and I'm right. So it's a, a communion is a call for us to examine ourselves. That's why we celebrate it. It brings us back to a point of saying, and it should bring a little bit of heaviness to us to say, hey, I'm about to partake of the Lord's body and blood in the unity of the body here. I need to make sure I'm right. So it's a great time for us to renew our commitment to Christ and to one another. And that's what Paul was trying to affect in the church in Corinth. He said, I want to get you right with yourself. I want to get you right with God. And I want to get you right with each other. And then we can really partake of communion the way that it ought to be. So as we prepare to serve communion here in just a few moments, I'd ask that you prayerfully recommit yourself to the Lord and to his people. And here are some commitments that I, that I, I like. These are not mine. I found these and borrowed these, but I really like this, and I think it would be good for it to be something we look at every now and then. But some commitments will make almost a covenant, a church covenant, if you will, of things that we will covenant together as a church family. First of all, I will protect the unity of my church. I'm going to do all I can to protect the unity. This church has such an incredible, strong sense of unity. It's probably the most unified church I have ever been around, bar none. I mean that sincerely. There's a strong sense of unity. All of us have to work to protect that. 
I'll protect it by acting in love towards one another. I'm not going to act in anger. I'm not going to act in hostility, frustration, impatience. I'm going to act in love towards my brothers and my sisters. Refusing to take part in gossip. We just did a whole few weeks on, on the sins of the tongue or holiness of the tongue. I'm going to protect the unity by not partaking in gossip. I'm going to protect unity by respecting and following the leadership of my church. I want to keep unity with me and the leadership and other people in the leadership. I'm not going to traffic in, in disloyalty. I will share the responsibility of my church. So I'm going to protect it, but I'm also going to share the responsibility of the church. The church was never designed for people to come and just be a consumer. It was never designed for someone just to be a partaker, but you're supposed to be a giver and involved also for there to be real unity. <clears throat> so I will share the responsibility of my church, first of all, by praying for its growth. We ought to be praying regularly, Lord, increase the river. Let us keep growing. Let us keep reaching. Let us keep growing. I want to pray regularly that this church grows. And faith without words or faith without action is dead. Faith without works is dead. So I'm not going to pray for its growth. I'm going to invite the unchurched to attend. You know, it's great to pray for revival, but it's a whole lot better when you put shoe leather to it and go invite somebody. Actually reach out to somebody and ask them to be here. And then not only that, and this one's critical, I know it seems trivial, but it's not. Warmly welcome those who do attend. Act like you're glad they're here. When a guest comes in, don't let them be off by themselves. Nobody sitting, to them, sitting next to them, nobody talking to them, nobody engaging them. You know, be sure that you are welcoming to all those who attend. I will serve the ministry of my church. I'll serve the ministry of my church by discerning my spiritual gifts and talents. I say, look, I've got something to contribute. I have something that God's equipped me with. I have skills and abilities that God gave me, and I want to discern those. I want to be equipped to serve by my pastor and my leadership. You know, I don't have these talents and abilities. I want leadership to help develop me and help lead me where I need to be and direct me into areas that will be beneficial to the church so that the church grows collectively. So I'll be equipped to serve by my leadership, my pastor and leadership. And then developing a servant's heart, being a true servant. That takes time to develop, but you can. You can learn to be a servant. You can develop a servant's heart, and we need to develop that servant's heart. I will support the testimony of my church. You know, this church has a testimony in the community. It has a testimony among us even. It, it has just like a witness of what it is. I'll, I'll, I will support the testimony of this church, first of all, by attending faithfully. I'm going to be here. When the doors are open, I'm here. Unless I'm out of town for some reason or I'm sick or a very valid reason, I'm going to be at church. I'm going to live a godly life. This is a godly church. We believe in holiness and separation from the world. We believe that. We don't believe in elitism or self-righteousness, but we believe a godly lifestyle matters. So I'm going to support the testimony of this church by living a godly life, being a representation in the community of what this church represents in these four walls. And lastly, being faithfully giving on a regular basis. I'm going to support the work of God through tithe, offering, missions, project renew, whatever it is we give to and, and, and thank God for faithful saints of God. And y'all are faithful. As far as I know, y'all are faithful. I hope you are. If not, it's a great time to become faithful, but to be faithful and to faithfully serve in the kingdom of God. I know that took a little while, but I just thought it would be good to go through some of that so you could see from a scriptural perspective what Paul was really addressing in the church in Corinth and why this communion, the unity of communion, is so important to you and I. If I can get our ushers that were on schedule tonight to help me, we have the service for communion in the Welcome Center. If you'll grab that real quickly. You have us offline, Brother Good, if you would at this point. Thank you.